Welcome back to Between the Before and After, a podcast about the stories that shape us. I'm your host, Coach John McLernan. In each episode, I bring you an inspiring guest with a moving story that shines a light on the power of the human spirit. I'm excited to share this story with you, so let's dive in. Uh, I am excited for any conversation that gets me talk about brains and trauma and how we can make our brains function better. And uh, as a father of two young children, I'm also keen to see them have healthy brains as well. So I'm excited to bring on Dr. Christopher uh, today. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, John. Very much, uh, very much. Uh, yes. Yeah, fantastic. So before we dive into kind of your story and how it led into the work that you're doing right now, what, what is it that you that you do right now? Right now, I am I am completing my next book, uh, Brain Talk. Um, okay. And it's a synopsis of, of what I've been doing over the last two years, which is I've been like in a uh, reflection of my experience in the field working with educators, parents, teachers, and children. So it's, it's a very reflective experience because I finally had the time to just sit down and dissect those experiences and move beyond just reflection to coming back to pragmatism. Yeah, fantastic. So um, you, you have a doctorate in education uh, and you have a passion for brains and a passion for, for children's brains as well in particular. And I'm, I'm absolutely curious is to learn about how you got to this place where this this is your life's work and passion. And so I want to kind of dive into your story a little bit. So if you could just give me a little bit of background on kind of what it was like for you, where, where you grew up, uh, what that was like for you, and that'll help to shape our understanding of how this got to the work that you're doing today. Absolutely. So I grew up in Oakland, California, during the, the uh, 50s and 60s eras where activism was very, very high. <laughs> and I was I was a student of the community trying to figure out things because it was difficult coming up at that time as a kid. My mother and father separated when I was about six or seven. I went from middle class to poverty, and then I was around children I had never experienced before. I had to fight every day. I had to do things differently. I had to figure things out, and it took me a while to begin to to. Tr- to try to understand how to defend myself and mm-hmm. still continue to evolve as a person. So I went through a lot of transitional phases, but I survived because of brain talk. I mean, what, what I'm saying is, is that you have this inner sense of feel for self mm-hmm. as a child that you may not understand. And when things happen to you, something inside you responds or allows you to respond. And you can feel that response moving through you. I call that talking to the brain, the brain talking back. So mm. that's the aspects of, of why I'm so involved in the brain and then children, because <clears throat> at the breath of life, that's where the crisis begins for many children. So when you look at my experience, you get me working with children who have been exposed to drugs while in utero, before or after, you really have to get back to, okay, now how did you experience that breath of life? Who who was the issues that were supposed to hold and care, care for you and bring you in contact to calm yourself down. Those are the things that led me to understand or, or to study the brain. I'm talking about the brain, body, and sense system. So when I talk about the brain, I'm not talking about neuroscience. I'm talking about the social cognitive event, but from a sense of feel for self, which means it's the physical neural self. So I got the neurology in there, mm-hmm. but that's because you and I are chemical processors. Once we have contact, right. our brain take over and everything then is communicated like virtual, like, like we're doing right now. It's invisible, but right. it's taking yeah. place. Yeah. So you, you did so this, that, you did this kind of, yeah, yeah. So you did this kind of um, as a child without fully understanding what it was that, that you were doing. I, I'd actually be curious to know a little bit more about, uh, uh, you know, Oakland, you grew up in Oakland, and and yeah. I know it's across the bay from San Francisco. And, it's, and sometimes I think maybe back then I don't, I'm wondering if it felt like it was two worlds apart. And you mentioned you know at six years old going from being middle class to being in poverty and that landing unit in a very different neighborhood. Uh, what can you tell me about sort of the dynamic between San Francisco and and Oakland when you were growing up? Oh, night and day, night and day. Um, but but you got to remember, Oakland is not far from Berkeley, so Berkeley was an incubator for liberalism. Okay. So I may have came up around difficult circumstances, but 
because the university in Berkeley was so active in my community, the Black Panthers and other organizations were able to thrive and deliver services to where, where I was in the ghetto. So it changed everything, the dynamic. But when you go to San Francisco, you're in a different world because San Francisco back then was like going to New York, okay? I'm talking about in terms of all the events and activities that are available to you. Oakland may have been live from, you know, but when you go to San Francisco, your whole world has opened up on a whole new level. So yeah, yeah. They, they were different. Yeah, that was like when I was in school, the school would take us on field trips and the right. field trip would to San Francisco. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. And the so, two of the ports, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that that's fascinating. And and of course, growing up in the the fifties and the sixties, um, and you mentioned like the black Black Panthers, and you know, I, I I'm a child of the eighties, so I'm a couple decades behind you here. But um, so you grew up in an era where where civil rights conversations were were starting to explode onto the forefront, and uh, sort of this racial divide was starting to. I don't want to say it was starting to maybe get mended, but it was certainly starting to explode in the public consciousness that we need to we need to uh, do something about this. How did that affect you as a child growing up? And sort of what was your understanding um, maybe uh, of the divide and, and what black people were fighting for in that time? It was, it, was a, it was a strategic balance, I would say. Again, I say because I, I lived in one place and then I separated from that place and went to a place where I had to experience the essence of the crises, mm -hmm. how black people really felt. Uh, mm -hmm. And then James Brown, his music, Say it loud, you're black and you're proud. That really took it to a new height. And yeah. you're trying to experience all of this. And then you have you have Malcolm dying, Martin dying, and you have all this stuff coming at you as a kid. And you can see the volatility because Greenman's Field was our, our primary in in the in, in, in the Hearst situation. Greenman's Field was used to hand out food and things like that. So it was mm -hmm. learning through the crises of self-awareness. Of, of what mm. was happening, what was taking place. So, you know, it was incubator of a brain talk. So I, I perceive it as I got older was my brain led me through the chaos because I stayed mm -hmm. balanced. I never, never allowed myself to, to enter those negative doors where I could be criminalized or allow myself to become a mental crisis because I disconnected from my sense of feel for self. So when I look back, I'm saying that's why I deal with the brain because my brain has always dealt with me. Mm -hmm. That's that's fascinating that you mentioned also like avoiding falling into criminality because I think understanding like poverty breeds criminality kind of out of desperation, uh, you know, among other things, just literally trying to trying to survive. Was there growing up? What was there an allure? to sort of going down that route as a as sort of a path of escape or what stopped you from doing that? Well, I was a leader. I was never a follower. And I, 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 I have uh, three brothers. I have uh, three brothers and three sisters. I'm the youngest boy. So I had a lot of people to learn from and understand mm -hmm. the things around me. They brought, they brought the information to me I'm a sibling, I'm in a sponge because I get to see them out there experiencing things that I didn't have to experience because it led me to understand, no, no, don't, I don't want that. So no, mm -hmm. uh, it is, no, but the most important part about the discussion is this, it's, it, it's a discussion I have to have every time I have an opportunity to talk about it. The brain, because the brain is the key. People get confused about, how their brains respond inside their bodies. I'm, I'm of the, I'm of the understanding that the brain moves through my sense of feel for self. So when I'm in crises, I can mm -hmm. feel myself drifting into that area, and then I can respond because the reflection is already moving through me. It's like mm -hmm. when, you, when you have a sense of feel, you are always aware or trying to become more aware of the environment because you're constantly processing that information and mm, you want mm. that contact interaction to move through you so you don't want to get caught up in it so you don't get caught up in it when you believe that there is more to you than just what you see and that's the physicality right. of getting away from behaviorism and moving into the cognitive side um, in education i learned how to read and interpret things and my teachers would tell me you know that 
you have a way of comprehending things. You mm-hmm. have a special way of, of, of com- I, I understood that because as I was getting older, even when I went to the to the military, there was something inside me that allowed me to do the things that I was doing. Mm-hmm. And those explanations we're talking about, and people talk about the mind, but I've learned that the mind is part of the reflection of the experience. And it's a storage base. But the brain is what you're trying to change because that would change is the state of mind. So my state of mind was never allowed to be static, but changing because of the way that I practice living each day to become more informed. That's mm-hmm. what I'm talking to you about, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we're, we're thinking about, you know, kind of like where, where you were born and raised and the seeds that were kind of planted in you and those experiences that help you to grow into who it is you are today and kind of the passion that you do. Now, you mentioned, you mentioned going into the into the military, and that's that's another interesting experience because I think um, for many people the military might be an escape from your life circumstances. Uh, would would that have been around the time that the Vietnam War was taking place that you were going in the military, or had that completed already? Well, the Vietnam War had just completed. You no, know, I, I served with Vietnam vets. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a big part of my experience because those were those were interactions where. They're constantly trying to tell you the difference between being in the military and being in the community and what you have to do in order to make it in the military and successfully exit the military honorably. So those right. are some heavy conversations we were having too. Right. And you know, when I think about the Vietnam vets and, and again, kind of the work that you do, like um, are you familiar with the work of Bass van der Kolk who wrote the book, uh, The Body Keeps the Score? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. No, that would be... I, you, you, I think you'd find it a very, very fascinating work. But one of his his primary areas of study was for with PTSD with Vietnam War veterans because he was trying to understand, you know, how did yeah. how did they how did they get so so traumatized and discarded and and how could it be that an experience from 20, 30, 40 years ago would be affecting somebody as though it was real today? And so that was that was like the sort of the essence of the work that he I'm I'm paraphrasing rather terribly sorry best van der kolk if you're listening but <laughs> it is he's he's the foremost i would say expert on ptsd and its manifestations in in the body and and the subjects he studied the most at that time were vietnam war vets which was pretty uh pretty immense yeah i under, i can understand that clearly i can i mean just 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 the uh the the service component and having to live every day to repair to to battle, mm-hmm. give your life, yeah. take a life in and of itself. But then, when you when you when you're in that situation, I served in Korea during the Iranian crisis, mm-hmm. and I served with a unit, and we were ready to give our lives. And when you when you're in that atmosphere, and you're around older military people that have been there and done that, it soothes you to realize, but not. Not understanding where you're coming from when it comes to post-traumatic stress disorder, because that's the other side. That's the after effect that mm-hmm. you experienced and that you couldn't have knew how you were going to experience that event and activity. I'm talking about the preparation process to prepare you for that event and activity. You mean during that period, we were allowed to have negative conflicts in and between other people in Korea, other service people coming across, coming into Korea, because yeah. we were we were the first unit to get there. So they gave us privileges. I'm talking about interactively because we communications were serving with grunt units. We had right, to hold it right. on. Yeah, yeah. So no, <laughs> I'm just saying that, that in the military, you have to realize, like they told me before I even came back home and got out, they said, you know, life is, is changed. When you go back home, you can't be that person you were because you won't live very long. Because mm-hmm. when you're in the military, there are things that you're trained to do. That if you do them outside, you're going to get a reaction Mm -hmm. because you're serious. Whereas before you may have been less inhibited to do things, certain things, but you've been prepared to do those things. And Mm -hmm. so you may do them. Like a lot of my ex-friends got in trouble when they got out robbing banks and so forth and so on. That's what they were talking about. You are prime for people to take advantage of you because of your expertise. You see, mm-hmm. so that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. But again, I'm saying to you, my my thinking has always been that that sense of feel for self allows me to discern negative and positive energy and move through the crisis of me long enough to experience the other side, which is what we're talking about. 
and allow mm. those teachings, those teachings that you left behind to kick in. So you mentioned, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned, and I can totally see this now, um, a, a teacher, I don't know if maybe it was in elementary school or if it was in high school, mentioned you have a way of seeing and processing things differently than maybe the, the average person. Um, so your, your perspective on life, you have a depth of perspective that maybe the average person could have but but doesn't have. And part of that might have been shaped by your experiences that caused you to sort of move into these states of mind. So I'm curious, as you were going through school, maybe even in elementary school, moving into like junior high, things like that, what what did you picture you were going to do with your life? What did you imagine you were going to be? What you know, when you have this young mind that has like this this unique way of seeing the world, um, back then what were you what were you thinking was a possibility for you? So I never, I never reached that point because I was just trying to survive my childhood. Mm. I mean, I was in, I was, I was surrounded by chaos. You know, right. not not the level of chaos. I'm talking about. There were so many things. Drugs coming into my community. All these things were happening when I was growing up. You're talking about the '80s. That's the crack epidemic. I'm talking about where the drugs, LSD, and all that stuff was coming into the community. Uh, Reds, all those drugs, all these different things that could that could destroy your life. Mm -hmm. And then the people evolving. I, I lived around the Hills Angels as another in, uh, informative experience. I mean, I lived around a lot of lot of e events that were current in the, in the day's culture as major life events. And trying to get through all that and survive because I'm hurt by the breakup between my mother and father. And I'm mm -hmm. just trying to figure out you now where do I fit in? How do I survive? Because I'm not like that. I'm not like this. And I was spoiled as, as a kid, as, as the youngest boy, by my siblings. Mm -hmm. And I had to figure these things out and not get caught up at the same time. So, so when it comes to talk, I played athletics. I was very good at it. Now, I didn't mm -hmm. ever dream about becoming a professional athlete because whatever I became, it was going to be part of that experience, the drive. Now, I listened to my teachers. I'm telling my teachers at that stage. Mm -hmm. They put information in me, but I never thought about being a doctor and lawyer. I just wanted to grow up and survive. Right. You know, just get to adulthood. Not be as devastated as the other people that I was watching. I had watched yeah. a lot of people beaten in the streets and and dying, you know, as I was growing up. So, no, I, it was about surviving. Oakland and my mom, she was a tune. She moved mm -hmm. us to East Oakland and North Oakland, where I was able to thrive. And then I began to, you, you, you can say I, I evolved into a state where, yeah, what am I really going to do in my life? But I never did focus on, I was in the experience, just moving through it, yeah, yeah. evolving. And then I was a leader. So, so you know, that's a tough question. You know, yeah. I look at it, in my experiences, I can attribute that to why I spent so much time with my children, hmm. moving them to visit universities. Fire departments, that was part of my, my program, was that they had to go experience these places and get an idea of what they want to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's where it came from. Yeah, yeah. I, and thank you for sharing that. I think you highlighted something really, really important. You know, um, many kids have the opportunity to imagine their future. In your situation growing up, you were thinking, I just want to make it to be an adult. Like, I just want to survive. This is a hard life. And I think that that perspective is is immensely valuable. So then I'm wondering, growing up, you're you're trying to survive this. You're going through all these challenging circumstances. Your mom's doing the best she can. She's getting to places. Um, who, who was a role model for you, or who did you look to to kind of guide you to maybe even just help you get through these experiences, help you to survive, help you to get to adulthood? Who did you look up to? So I just reviewed an article for Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that that's what saved me was when my mom and my father broke up, I was around smart kids. Mm -hmm. I was around smart kids. I mean, kids who were smart. They were smarter than me. And that's what he was saying. You find people that are smarter than you. And those kids put it in me, the information in me yeah. that helped me evolve. We were all from different, different houses, but the things that skills they brought to the table was social and academic. And again, I'm mm -hmm. saying I've always had this capacity to comprehend the experience 
of other people through my sense of feel for self. So yeah, I'm saying the kids that I grew up with um, at that time, and then I advanced beyond them, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. then I'm open sponge to just learning how to live yeah. and become more informed to survive. To survive what? Me, I was a gang leader. Survive right. me, my state yeah. of mind. I had, <laughs> yeah. to me. I had to keep me under control. And that's what these experiences were teaching me. How do you survive you? Because yeah. you part of the crisis. You got to remember when a mother and father break up and you're a young kid and no one talks to you, you have anger. Mm -hmm. You have feelings of anger in you. You're going to do some things that you regret. But because I'm saying I had a sense of feel for self in my brain, I cared. I yeah. cared yeah. about hurting people. Yeah. 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 So um, if you were to meet, let's say maybe third or fourth grade you, <laughs> you know, maybe nine, nine, 10 years old kind of thing. How would you explain what it is that you do now to, at, to a level or at a level that third or fourth grade or fifth grade, you might be able to understand? Well, see, that's a transformative issue. I, I, I'm changing and I don't realize that I'm changing because as a kid, you're doing things you don't know how it's going because you, you have no sense of like that question you asked me. You have no sense. You see a dream, but if you're surrounded by things that are happening that are not good for your sense of receive path because of what you're actually seeing, then the other side is not so clear for me. That's exactly mm -hmm. what I'm saying. It's a formative state that that is happening as long as you continue to make the right choice decisions. Now that's the problem being a kid, because that's what you're trying to learn how to do, make the appropriate choice and decisions that allow you to become more experienced at becoming more informed. But yeah, I yeah. stop here because that's a, that's a heck of a question for me to go all the way back. But I tell you this, like I said, the breath of life, the breath of life experience, when I work with my children, I'm constantly looking at what you just now said, because I got to reflect back as I reflect on them. I call that human systems research, which is a study of self in relation to other people. So mm. when I deal with you or anyone else, I look at myself first, like you're doing with me, the experience of self in relation to you. Now I got to go back to wherever you send me because I want to assume nothing. I want to experience what you're trying to say to me and then go to the, the environmental effect and then I have the knowledge base to really comprehend the experience. And yeah. that's what you're asking me. So it's a formative thing. Absolutely. <clears throat> so if we shift back into your, your young adulthood, uh, you spent some time in the military. Uh, how many how many years did you serve before uh, exiting the military? Four. Four years. Okay. Four, yeah. And then from there, did you transition into, because you, you have your doctorate of education, did you transition into the university or were you, did you already start university while you were in the military? No, I started. I started going back to school while I was in the military. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the fascinating things about the journey is that, you know, I went in the in the Marine Corps and I was angry, and I was difficult to, to handle. But when you talk about mentoring, I got mentored. I yeah. got mentored by white people, black people, uh, Samoans. I got mentored. <laughs> oh, because they cared. I mean, because I was yeah. aggressive. I was yeah. And they, they they, just talked to my brain. They just kept talking to me, saying, hey, I was there, man. But hey, because when you're in the military, it's acceptable for you to be angry. But can you control that anger? Because that's what they taught you, how to control that anger, how to right. focus that anger, how to harness so, it. Yeah. yeah, to channel it so that you don't make uh, a foolish mistake, but you're, you're in the most, uh, let's say, alert state to deal with whatever might come your way. If you're responsive, yeah, if you're responsive yeah. to the flow of information and if you can connect it and not be offended by it, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Because by the time I, I exited the Marine Corps, they had me back in school. So I dropped yeah. out. They they brought me back and and and, and encouraged me, no, you got to go and you got to get that high school diploma. I got the high school diploma before I even exited. And yeah. again, you're talking about experiencing military men and women who were encouraging you because they knew the physicality of you and they saw you 
evolving. I didn't see it, but they were seeing the changes in me from where we first began and what they heard about me and what they're experiencing in the now. Right. I left the Marine Corps with an honorable discharge, and I have a lot of other people who who have who try to stay in connect contact with me. But I'm the type of person when I leave, I leave. I don't. I, that's that's one of the things my mom and dad's experience taught me. I couldn't bring those those children from East Oakland with mm. me because I would have brought an effect of that mm-hmm, character mm-hmm. I'm trying to leave behind. And my mom is saying, "You can't. No, you got to stop that." If you, right. if we do this, yeah. you got to come here and you got to leave that behind. So that's that's my experience. I leave it behind. I don't go yeah. back unless unless it's a true friend, a true spirit. I don't yeah. I don't look back because I don't want to carry okay. that back and contaminate yeah. my future. Yeah. And so uh, somewhere along the way, you mentioned you yourself have children. So your father, and uh, so somewhere along the way, you, you met someone and. Uh, you know, you're, you're this transformed person. Um, who did you meet and how did you meet? Well, uh, I met my wife through through my uh, brother. This yep. was shortly after I got in the Marine Corps, actually. Um, again, um, you're confused. When you're a young person, you're confused. I mean, we're talking about how do you be a parent, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, how do you be a parent when you didn't have, have that type of childhood I'm telling you, no, it's a responsibility, you know? And so the breath of life, again, we go back to the breath of life because, you see, if you're not feeling the breath of life and you can't get into that child the way that child needs you to get into them, then that child falls behind. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you got to catch up and the kids got to catch up. So now there's a disconnect because this kid is experiencing things that the kids shouldn't experience. So when we go to that level, we talk about my son who, who developed schizophrenia. And I... As a doctor of education, I'm saying you should have knew, you should have caught it, you should have found it, you should have already knew how to address it. And I'm saying that's part of the experience of understanding. That's how I develop human systems research, or human system science, and all the other things that I'm talking about. Because mm-hmm. I had to work with my son, I had to figure out. Because my wife came to me, she said, "Look, what you gonna do? You know, our sons in crises. What you gonna do? It's like you talk, stop talking, start listening." and start learning how to help your son. Mm -hmm. So I did that. I went back and I I went from the beginning. I went from his breath of life, I studied him from there, and I continued to talk to his brain, not his body, because Mm -hmm. the sense of feel for self was disconnected. So I'm saying to you, the pain and hurt of experiencing him then and realizing, man, you should have caught this a long time ago. And moving through that, and then work with other children and seeing mental illness as a stage process cycle where mm. it, evolves. it evolves from one place to another. But there are always early signs okay. of, of the injury, illness or the effect that yeah. you're not you're not attuned to, that you may not be attuned to. So I, I get understanding, understanding that most parents miss it. Because it's so prevalent in our society, it's so prevalent in our community. But if I if if I if I listen to what you're asking me, that is my greatest challenge in my life was moving and le- learning how to understand my son's crises and getting him to a point where he felt comfortable with who he was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, w- I want to take one step back because I'm because I think there's there's a really important dynamic here that I want to draw out, but um, when you first met the woman who would become your wife, um, what stood out to you where you said, hmm, like, I'm attracted to this woman. I think that she could be a potential mate. Well, it was first, it was the fact that we had a long discussion. Mm-hmm. And the discussion evolved what, who I was, who I thought I was, who she was, who she thought she was, and the contract. The contract was, this is how I am, this is how you are, and if we can come together, because my philosophy has always been that a family is a business. It has to be developed as one. And so we agree to these parameters, and then we decide to get married. But we had a okay. contract. Uh, not a written contract, but a right. contract. And that allowed me to hold her responsible for her behaviors and me responsible for my behaviors and allowed me to control my behavior, my physicality, 
because the, the bottom line with her was you better never put your hands on me. Right. So, yeah. And that was yeah. number one. So I already you know you have to have that up front so that you no, know, it when you got a sense of feel for self, you want that person to say that so that you understand you can defend yourself by saying, I don't do that. I'm mm -hmm. not gonna allow myself to do that. And that's a defense mechanism built into whatever state of mind you're you're living through. And that helps you move to that relationship because you know when you cross that line, it's over. And so that's the purpose of a contract between me and her because she knew if you do these things, I'm out. Right, right. Okay. And so uh, along along the way, um, you had your son. Uh, how, how many children did you have? I only have two. Two. Okay. Boy and a girl. Okay. And is the son older or younger? My son passed in 2013. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Childhood, childhood schizophrenia and then the complications with the effects of the disorder, the, uh, the uh, eating disorder and other things that happened to him. Yeah, that self-inflicted because when you have schizophrenia, you're trying to, you're, trying to, you're delusional. So you mm -hmm, do things mm -hmm. and it's hard to, to uh, recover that sense of feel where you can make sense of what's happening or what happened. Now, that's mm -hmm. where the parenting comes in because that's why you talk to the kid's brain. And that's what we, we were very successful at is developing a practice where he could live with us because we constantly talked to his brain and read his feedback cycle. So the way mm -hmm, he would respond, mm -hmm. we don't look at the brain. I mean, we don't look at the body. We look at his brain and we look at the body only to read the messages coming from his brain to see how confused he is in the situation we're working through. Most mm -hmm, often, mm -hmm. it allowed him to look at us. We taught him to look at us and study us to get a real sense of what we're trying to explain to him. So that allowed him to use our physics to help him understand what we were saying. So mm -hmm. when he gets in trouble, he do, he only needs to look in our eyes and see and feel or act like he could feel. That's what we're teaching. We talk to the brain. You're trying to teach that person what they can't do through you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so instead of, instead of showing fear, I show firmness, but I don't curse. Right. I just stand firm and I talk firm to his brain, not his body. <laughs> and I'm telling him what his body is doing. He can look at that and see that and laugh at you. But what you want him to do is to act like he can actually reflect on the experience itself. That's, <laughs> you know, it takes time to build that relationship. That's what you're really talking Absolutely. about. That's what you're really talking so you, about with, with mental health issues. Right, right. Um, so your son, your son and your daughter, your son who passed in 2013, um, and your daughter, was your daughter old? Is your daughter older or was she younger? She was two uh, years son? older than him. Two years Okay. okay. And um, did your daughter happen to struggle with any of this or just your son? Just my son. Okay. And that sets up a really interesting family dynamic here that you're trying to experience and balance because you're trying to be a father, you're trying to be a provider, you're trying to be a husband. And, you know, you have these two beautiful children and one of them is struggling with, with this schizophrenia. Uh, how, how old was your son when you first came to understand that what he was struggling with was schizophrenia? Wow. I think it was his 13th birthday. 13, 13. He was 13. Yes. Okay. Okay. But we had warning signs. We just didn't pay attention to them. Right. Yeah. Right. When you look back, what, what would some of those warning signs have been? Delusional. Uh, you know, we called it his imagination, but it was more than just his imagination. He was disconnecting. Right. Yeah. 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 And so you, you had learned there's a way to reach him because, you know, I, I, don't, I can't claim to understand schizophrenia all that well, but the brain is seeing and hearing things that that are not there. Um, but because, uh, because it's happening in the brain to the individual experiencing it, it feels as though it's very, very real. And so part of your work with your son was to try to be an anchor for him. Like this is real. Provide a safe place for him to experience himself. That meant mm -hmm. to make sure that we had rules in place that he accepted, but to give him freedom so that he would not escape and go live in the streets. So mm -hmm. there was another contract, but the contract was created through the experiences of bringing him under self-control, where he would control himself because of what was happening to him out in the community, police. Mm -hmm other types of interventions. Right. And us continuously 
working with his brain, not his body, and him experiencing people and realizing even though he was not feeling us, he mm -hmm. understood he mm -hmm. needed protection. Right. He needed yes. protection. So you yeah. can't, you cannot, you can't recreate what isn't. You have to mm -hmm. go from where it is. That's why you let him have his free space because he's going to tell you how to care for him. And yeah. what you what I'm mostly concerned about is that he doesn't hurt himself or others. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so the challenge with that, so <clears throat> it is others, he, like he, he doesn't walk around with a sign, you know, saying I have schizophrenia. So others right. might see a, a pattern of behavior. They might see an interaction or things and it doesn't make sense to them because they don't have the necessary context. And so that might shape the interactions that he experiences because um, they don't know what to do with this. Uh, did that lead to your son struggling with, I mean, to I imagine to some degree, struggling with some social interactions to potential interactions with the law? Um, how did how did he learn to navigate that and communicate his struggles with you? Number one, as a parent, I was I was very, very focused on discipline. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. physical discipline, I'm talking about mental discipline. So my mm -hmm. son focused. He understood community because I had him in community. I raised him playing baseball, football. I was constantly teaching him how to control himself, how mm -hmm. to sit mm -hmm. still, how to listen. And so when this happened, he didn't lose those skill sets. Those skill sets were still there. You had to reconnect it to the situation that he was in. He already had it. Like he graduated from high school with a 3.8. But that mm -hmm. was because he was a student and he knew how to interact with people. That's what I'm saying. You, you have to put that work in as a parent. And the work you put mm -hmm. in is, is like that question you asked me about my future. If I'd have had the discipline self-control that I was delivering to him, I would have gone much, much further in my experience. And that's what we're talking about now, because when, as he began to de develop the disconnect and then the psych psychosis and the breaks, he still was able to go into these environments and control himself. And act mm, out so fully. Yeah, because he's a thinker. No, that's what I, this is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. teach your child to think through the sense of feel for self, even though schizophrenia takes away that feel because you can't feel things, okay? When, mm, you, mm, mm. when you disconnect psychologically, your sense of feel for self and others is broken. Mm, and that's mm. what you're, you're trying to help them reconnect methodically through your levels of talking to the brain. You talk to the mm, brain mm. because you want them to feel your words and experience them. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, because that is that is that's why you study neuroscience or you study the social cognitive effect. The social, I'm external, I'm social. He's internal. We want him, his neural systems to kick in and recognize me as his father, trying mm -hmm. to get him information. So mm -hmm. you talk mm -hmm. to his brain, not his body. Because if right. you talk to his body, you're talking about his behavior. You're talking to his behavior, and that's what everybody else is doing. Talking about his right. behavior and not talking about thinking things through it's not talking about what he yeah. is experiencing in his brain in that moment and um was he able to express to you in like moments of clarity like this is what i'm seeing this is what i'm feeling this is what i'm experiencing and did he demonstrate an awareness in some of those instances where he recognized it wasn't real but it was real to him because his brain was experiencing it see that's schizophrenia that's brain talk he talks all the time and inside the entire context is me on the bone because he's talking to you. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you have to discern and not be afraid of what he's saying because you have to, I kept notes, for example. Mm -hmm. He drew, he did all the things that gave us a ton of stuff to look at to know that we were safe. Mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about. But mm -hmm. that's the crises. See, most, most people, it's, it's such a, an arduous task and journey that I can understand why parents give up mm -hmm. because you have to be on. You have to be on 24-7 because yeah. a break can happen or a psychological event can happen while he's sleeping and he's gone. And you got to be aware 
that he's in that context all the time. Mm -hmm. And so everything you do has to be to help. Like I said at the beginning, I wanted to talk to him, so I always talk to him about his brain, his brain, not his mind, his brain. Right. Because when you're talking to a kid about the brain, no one talks about the brain. You go to psychologist, psychologist is talking, or the psychiatrist talking, but they don't talk about the brain. They talk about the body, talk about behavior, but they never talk about the brain, which is what you're trying to get contact with so that the kid understands there's something inside me beside the voices. Right. But yeah. you're praying for understanding. But on the outside, you know what you're trying to accomplish. But remember what I said. Mm -hmm. You're looking at his, his, his behavior response for attraction and feedback as to whether your information went through him or not. Now, when he's sitting at the table talking like he's talking, he's giving me that feedback. Because he's saying, <laughs> he's saying like, yeah, Dad, you think you know everything, but you know what? But then he's doing it. So that's mm -hmm. your information to meet on the bone. So you listen. You right, listen. Right. You help him stay calm because he's not hurting anybody. He's working it out. That's a sense of feel for self that you talk mm -hmm. about. That he's lost, but he's showing you that I felt what you're saying, man. I, mm -hmm. I'm okay with you. But then look, he never was a threat to self and others because we kept talking to his brain. He stayed mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. from allowing people to anger him he walk away. He would he would exit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if it was somebody that he knew or someone who was a direct threat to him, his upbringing was no. You don't let people do things to you, right? But again, we talk about decision making. He never allowed himself to get caught up in a violent situation because he understood. I don't want to go back to Smith, which is a mental health facility. I don't want right. that experience anymore. That's what you're working from. You're working from understanding when that contract is designed from the actual experience that he goes through. You have to mm -hmm. make you have to maintain your side because when you're talking to him, he's not stupid. You do a contract because he's saying, "I will try to live up to this contract," and that's how we work. We didn't, we, and this is this is not no written contract. Mm -hmm. that's, that's part of the, the test. That's part of mm -hmm. the sound test. Can you adhere to what you said you was going to adhere to? Right. Yeah. It's ups and downs, but he never left the border of the country. Mm -hmm. okay? Right. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious in, in all of this, um, how, how did your daughter experience this and how was she able to interact with your, your son while he was alive? My, my daughter thought it was, it was, it was nothing wrong with him and that it was normal. But I'm saying again, that's the community effect. They don't understand mm -hmm. mental illness. They don't understand what mental illness is. They think that it's okay when someone loses control. I'm talking about loses psychological control and is out of their head talking. Mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. You know, you listen to rap music, you listen to, and they think it's normal when it's not normal. It's mm -hmm. not a normal thing. That's why you go back and you say, well, how did you miss it? A lot of people miss it because they think it's normal. That's not mm -hmm. normal behavior, first of all. That, that It's not. Yeah. And, and so it, about 10 years ago, it was your your son passed. And I mean, that's got to be an incredibly difficult experience to go through as, as a father and for, for your wife to go through as well. And even for your daughter to go through the loss of a brother. How did you as a family navigate that loss? Wow. It's a coming together. It's an understanding, you know. Uh, no, because you see, again, I'm saying to you, um, it's sadness. It's sadness, but his pain is gone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The hurt that he was experiencing is gone. I'm talking about the um, the side effects of schizophrenia, mm -hmm. the eating disorder, the diabetes, heart failure, all those things that contributed. Because you see, I have I had another neighbor down the street, and he, her kid came up with schizophrenia too. He committed suicide. What I'm saying is, what, what, what his doctor explained to me is, he doesn't feel pain the way you feel, right. right? So we're looking at his body and they're explaining us, but he doesn't feel that. He mm -hmm. doesn't feel that deterioration. So I'm talking to him and we're, if we had fights, it was fights trying to get him to eat right, trying to get him right. to do things yeah. that would curb the effect of the diabetes on his, his organs, his nervous system functions and things like that. 
he was he was supposed to have, have uh, died in 2000. Let's say we got to notice from his his his, his primary care physician because of the damage that had already been done in mm -hmm. around 2002 2003, and we got him to manage and control himself and expanded that window, never actually getting control over the diabetes, but the changes in his diet and all those things allowed him to live with us through 2013, where he finally mm -hmm. died, just yeah. before his birthday, yes. And so, and, and you would say at that point in time, <clears throat> to some degree, because of the, the challenges you experienced, that you were, in a sense, kind of mentally prepared as much as you could be for that experience, because you had kind of, you had already experienced that he, you know, he, he probably wouldn't live uh, a long life into his 70s and 80s. He was much smarter than I am. I, I, no, I'm, I'm going to say it. No, it, it's because he was much smarter than me. No, because, see, when it, you have a lot of people that are mentally ill that do things that everybody's in awe about. And some people say, well, you know, he is really, really different. He is really, really on the other side. But, uh, but no, you don't lose that. Mm -hmm. You don't lose that. You, 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 have, you have a disability. But what type of disability do you have? What functions can you not access? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're talking about a young person who had a future, mm -hmm. who had to had to understand that future is no longer available because now you can't function in those ways you were able to function yesterday. And how do you catch up to your peers who are now disassociating themselves from you because of the things that you are exhibiting and going through? Mm -hmm. Okay, no, you you have to deal with the reality of that child who is now regressing from this mental frame to a, a, a lesser degree, a lesser degree, a le and diminishing capacity simultaneously. No, it is mm -hmm. the psychological effect of the crises that that child has moved through, and that requires growth. But you don't have mm -hmm. growth without self-understanding to have personal growth. And so, no, I'm saying to you, it's because he was very intelligent that he was able to overcome the demons as long as he was able to overcome them along with mm -hmm. his parents working diligent with him. I understood my son to be intelligent. Mm -hmm. That's why it all worked. I always yeah. talked to his brain. I always talked to his brain, not his body. Right, yeah. <clears throat> and as we as we come to, to a close here, um, fascinating conversation. Um, it's it's really it's quite something to think about how you from your childhood experiences to your experiences as a father how it really shapes the work that you do and and um, you know you mentioned many times just the importance of of being able to speak to the brain not to the behavior and um, I know you've authored uh, is it uh, four books or five books now it's five yeah it's five F five yeah. books yeah <clears throat> and so and you're working on a sixth book yes. Mm -mm. And so people are are interested in uh, the, the books that you write and they want to learn more about the work that it is you do. Um, where would they find those books? Amazon. I have an Amazon page. Um, mm. Yeah, Amazon bookstore. I have an Amazon page there. I have a website, drchristopherkslayton.com. Um, awesome. I have a another website, uh, brainsbody.net. Um, yeah. They can they can awesome. access my material, and then I also have a podcast, Brains Body Podcast. Okay, fantastic. And so they can find that podcast on on Apple, Spotify, iTunes, that kind of thing. Yes, yes. Fantastic. And so, <clears throat> maybe the last question to to close out. So we had a really interesting conversation today. You've got you've got a very different way of seeing the world, and I think it's it's a it's a way that's worth sharing. Everybody has, let's say, a perception of of you and and who they see, you know, how you live life, who they see you to be. What is your perception of you? I'm a most, I'm the most difficult person to deal with because I'm constantly requiring that you do more mm -hmm. because I do more. If you interact yeah. with me, it's not going to stop. We got to work. We got to get this mm -hmm. done. What is it? What what is it? No, because there's something burning inside me that I'm challenged by every single day. And mm -hmm. so when we make contact and we do what we do, just like my wife and I, it's about evolving into the higher 
level of successful engagement to create that environment that isn't. Mm. And we're talking about children and parents in crisis having safe places. Like I said about my son, having a safe place to be mentally upset, but safe, right? And giving them the ability to recover as, as much as they possibly can because they have your support. Mm -hmm. So you become the eyes and ears. So that's a lot of work. Because when you're dealing with children in crises, they need not only support, but they need safe places to evolve. Like my early childhood, I'm saying to you, I could have went to any one of my friends' homes because it was a safe place. Mm -hmm. And their mm -hmm. parents allowed me to be there, although I was, because as a gang leader, I protected them in that environment. Mm -hmm. And the parent realized that. Most of the parents realized that. I'm saying to you, no. Trying to understand the child in crises, trying to come to terms with the fact that you want to know if there's more to them than just the physicality. Mm -hmm. So you look at the brain, not mm -hmm. the body. You look at the brain, you look at the responses. And and because you, you can realize the communication coming back at you. He cares. He mm -hmm. don't care. There's something wrong. Oh, oh, that's that's appropriate, especially when they see you talking to their kid and you're mm -hmm. making sense to their kid and you're not telling their kid. You know, your, your dad is, your mom is, you know, and it's not destructive, negative energy moving through that environment where you're saying he's a disruptive force. Still, you look at the, at the you look, you're looking at the body and that tells you the brain is not working right because this kid should not be making those kind of statements and inside your home causing friction. I mean, that mm. tells you he's got to go. No, yeah. that's, that's brain talk. No, you, you got to recognize that. Why? Because that's why. God gave us this inner sense of feel for self and other people. That's mm. how you how you move through me, whether you like me or not. You have a feel for me, right? Now, either you like me or you don't. But most people, I'm telling you, when you get off, you got to go another level if you're going to dissect this interview. Mm -hmm. That's me. So I'm a lot of work. Yeah. I'm a lot of work. So there's your answer. <laughs> you know, because I am a lot of work because it takes a lot of work for me to live and learn how to continue to evolve inside mm -hmm. my human system. Here it is. Well, Dr. Christopher Slayton, thank you so much for being on today. It's been a, it's been a very intriguing conversation, and I look forward to when we have another conversation. I look forward to it too. I, I'm gonna tell you, you caught me off guard with many of your questions. I hope that when I I review them, that they look and feel the way that I feel, having responded to them, and then this is our first level of engagement. I look forward to the future. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much for tuning in to Between the Before and After. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave a review because that helps this podcast to reach and inspire more people. I love exploring the stories that take place between the before and after, the powerful experiences that shape who we become, and I love human potential. I love the possibilities that lie within us. So whatever you may be up against, I hope these stories inspire you because if you're still here, your story's not done yet, so keep moving forward.